Dr. Eric Antworker is back for his second interview. He's a pediatric otolaryngologist at Cohen's Children's Hospital and Northwell Health. I know we've had a few pediatric otolaryngologists on the show, and I promise this has nothing to do with pediatric otolaryngology. He's an associate professor of otolaryngology at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra and vice president medical director at Level X, a medical video game company. That's what we talked about in the previous interview, leveraging video games for skill building, but this episode is completely different. We talk education. As physicians, we're responsible for teaching in lecture settings, on rounds, in office hours, and for some of us in the operating room or during procedures. So we discuss what we know of current educational science and how to apply it for each of those settings so we can be the best teachers we can be. Dr. Gantwerker holds a Master's of Medical Science and Medical Education with a focus on educational technology, educational research, cognitive science of learning, and curriculum development from Harvard Medical School and a Master of Science in Physiology and Biophysics from Georgetown. His clinical focus includes complex aerodigestive disorders, airway reconstruction, children with tracheostomies, and persistent obstructive sleep apnea and quality improvement. I am sure you're all going to enjoy this. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Eric Gantworker, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. We missed you. Ah, Thanks so much, Brad. Great to be here. We're going to be talking about medical education, education again. And uh, we we recently interviewed someone who you recommended that I interview. And it it was a great one, Dr. Margaret Hay. So if, if if anyone listening to this now hasn't heard that one, definitely check that one out as well. And I'm going to do something that I, I hate doing. And I'm going to repeat a question that I asked her for, for you because I, I sure. thought it was a really good question. So how do we teach our students without making them feel like garbage, right? There's so many times in our training where I just felt like a failure, a flunky, uh, like, you know, this whole imposter syndrome, like I shouldn't be here. And I feel like because we put so much pressure on ourselves, right? We're high achievers. We've made it this far. And now we're put in this position where we just suck. We don't know anything. And we're constantly getting questions wrong. We're constantly, you know, incapable of doing things that are asked of us. So how do we take someone like that and teach them without making them feel even worse about themselves? It's absolutely true. And I there's a great paper that I don't know if Mark mentioned it, but uh, there's a paper called Socrates Was Not a Pimp. And if if nothing else, you should read it because it's one of the greatest titles of any paper I've ever read in my entire life. But the whole concept of how our teachers learned how to teach was through modeling, right? So they watch their teachers teach. And that whole idea, especially for surgical specialties, is this pimping, this asking random questions. Mm-hmm. So the first thing is, and I know Mark had talked about a little bit, was creating a safe space. So allowing people to be wrong and not suffer the consequences. Um, the that's a really subtle skill to be able to create that, and especially in an environment where you may have more than one student and, or multiple levels of students and trainees in the same group. And there's different ways to manage that. We may touch on that a little bit later, but creating that safe space so that people can feel okay to be wrong. One technique that we might talk about a little bit later is using anonymous polls. So when you're actually in a group where you're trying to elicit people's information, being an anonymous is a good way to do it in a large group when you're doing PowerPoints and you're using an honest response system. But one-on-one, just create a space where it's okay for them to be wrong, but they have to make a choice. Right. And that that eliciting that information should be concept based, not fact based. Declarative facts living in a vacuum aren't helpful for students like, hey, what is the third cranial nerve? Yeah, that's great. I mean, understand that. Do more concept based because conceptual understanding is much more difficult and will give you much more insight in their abilities to understand what's going on as opposed to a random fact that's devoid of any connection. So, well, so creating that space and saying, hey, you know, I, for example, I sit with students and I say, tell me what you know about Strider. And they'll say, oh, it's inspiratory. I was like, okay, why do you think it's inspiratory? Instead of telling them that they're wrong, I actually, I inquire and find out more. 
And that appreciative inquiry is, is sometimes what they call it, but say, okay, okay, you think it's inspiratory. Tell me why. Tell me your logic. I'm not telling you you're wrong, but you're partially right. And so then they ask them to say, and they're like, I don't know. I was like, take a guess. Like, you don't, you don't, you don't have to be right or wrong. Just take a guess. You have to form a thought. So that's sort of how I do it. And the facts, I feel like if, if it's significant enough to what you end up doing, you're going to get so much repetition that you're going to memorize those things anyway. Right. Correct. Like you, you, and you could look it up. And if you have to look it up a bunch of times over and over, eventually you won't have to look it up anymore. So it's the concepts that are really important and not the memorization. So, so, Absolutely. you know, putting the emphasis on that to begin with is, I feel like more important. Absolutely. Because again, as faculty, one thing that we're going to realize as our students and trainees are coming up, the idea of fact-based knowledge is going to be relegated to the internet. We're not going to have to remember what the third cranial nerve is. We're going to have to understand how, why a tumor may affect several nerves at the same time. Like understanding that concept is very different from naming that third cranial nerve. Right. So that's going to be a huge shift for us as faculty to go away from the fact based quizzing to more conceptual based because that's where they need the help. They need the help to understand the concepts and the foundations and the principles and not the fact, random facts that we used to pimp on. But when you are pimping, <laughs> what is the esoteric music that you pimp about? Right. Is it like grunge? Oh, yeah. K-pop. So when you are doing the pimping, what type of music is it about? It's always uh, movie quotes uh, is more. I, I in My internship, I had a general surgeon who the only thing he pimped you about was music and movies. Never anything medically related. Never. We we all still have. They're, they're, they're still out there. Those, <laughs> those attendants are still out there. Okay. So let's take a, a wider lens here. So one, just tell me briefly about the Harvard education program that you were a part of. Yeah, so I was uh, I was the guinea pig. I was the first cohort, and I happened upon it as I was actually interviewing for jobs, and I saw it as a sign. I'm I'm a big believer in in fate to some extent, and right when I was about to start to be serious about job hunting, I found out about this master's program that they were starting now. Uh, the master's program, the graduate program at the Harvard Medical School has a bunch of different degree granting programs. And this was their first time. They have a traditional master's in education that runs through the education school that's been for years and years and years, one of the top programs in the country, obviously. And so they were just starting this med ed program. And basically, the, there's good things and bad things about being a guinea pig. The good thing is, is that you basically create the program that you want for yourself. So there was a lot of latitude to try and do things. For example, I wanted to take classes at MIT. Well, MIT is off cycle with Harvard Medical School. And so, and there's no uh, official affiliation between the two. So, but because I was a guinea pig and I was like, hey, I want to try this. I want to take out this game-based learning class at MIT at the Shell Institute. And they're like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let you do it. So I did, I did it off cycle. Uh, you know, so it was a great opportunity to engage with both the K-12 education, because we basically took a lot of classes with the master's of education students, but then we took classes at the business school, at the government school, at the public health school, um, obviously at the medical school itself. And so it gave us a lot of flexibility and it was a thesis-based two-year master's. So it was educational research master's. So, but we made with it what we wanted and that was a huge opportunity for me and really formative in how I decided to spend the rest of my career. And so what, are the overarching themes that you learn there that you want to see throughout medical education? What are the big reforms you want made to the system? The biggest thing is that there is a, a reckoning of sorts coming. The way that medical education was taught in, you know, even the turn of the century and the way that even some people have adapted it is, is antiquated. And it's not really setting us up for the future clinicians that we're going to need to be who are leveraging technology much more than they have in previous years. So that's the first is like, don't fear technology. I think still a lot of medical schools fear technology and they don't allow students to use technology, but in the real world, they're going to be using technology. It's a very uh, antiquated system to think that 
you know, these fact-based, these memories, the assessments that are very fact-based are going to serve them well in the future, and they're really not. So we we know that. The the other is is that the idea behind how how to teach. A lot of our faculty never learned how to teach. They modeled it, and we talked about it a little bit before, off of how people taught them. And that faculty identity shift from being a content deliverer to a co-facilitator of learner uh, of learning is what has to happen across the nation. The idea that somebody would sit on a stage for eight hours and pontificate at medical students and they would go out learning it is an antiquated system that is not supported by the data. We have to understand that active learning is better than passive learning. We have to understand that didactic teaching is not the most efficient way that people learn. And that fact-based knowledge transition is not the way that people learn. It's conceptual-based. It's foundations-based. And it's applicable and context-specific to how they're going to be in the real world. The example I always give is, uh, you know, when I was working at um, on my master's, we worked on a pre-matriculation program for medical students who were starting medical school in the fall. So it was basically to level set them. It became um, something from HMX Foundations, is, or Fundamentals, I think is what it's called now. But we were teaching partial pressures to pre-matriculated medical students. But the idea was, is we weren't teaching it in a vacuum. Sorry, the pun. But we weren't teaching partial pressures in a vacuum. The partial pressures were taught bringing them to the ICU and saying, this is why it matters for you to learn partial pressures. And then they would contextualize it in real life scenarios like diving and getting the bends and using these concepts that people grasp onto and understand and then relate it to this foundational theory and then apply it to the bedside scenario before they've ever seen patients. And this immediate application of these conceptual based models is the future of how medical education should be taught. Is your mic available to drop? (laughs) <laughs> it's suspended so yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll try my best <laughs> <laughs> no, amazing amazing yes uh um so so with that in mind these this you know the active application and intertwining the basic science that's actually relevant to um the the case presentation you know like so vertical right from from the very basic science to to direct patient application um, sounds like it, it's it's the way to go. Uh, I'm I'm sold. I'm hooked. So now the next step is taking that and and bringing that to the different scenarios, right? To ward rounds, to office hours, to the OR, to lectures, like grand rounds, right? So all the different venues where we're teaching and learning. I would like you to give us some pearls and pointers about how. All of us who who came who grew up in teaching, learning from people who never studied how to teach, we're all striving to be a better teacher ourselves. That's why we're listening right now. Like, what is it that we can bring to the table that'll make us better teachers tomorrow? So let's start with ward rounds, right? Something that I don't do. I'm in private practice. I go to the <laughs> hospital, I see my patients, I leave. Um, but sometimes, you know, at least on peds, sometimes I'll encounter, you know, someone and have the opportunity to show them how much I know. So I will talk. Yeah. Them. Um, so what, you know, what can, what are a couple of things or even a singular thing that, that attendings residents can do on ward rounds to be better. So, teachers? so one of the things uh, in a lot of scenarios where they have multiple levels of learners, so they have a medical student, they may have a resident, they may have a chief resident, and the way that I've always thought is you should engage all of them at the same time, but take advantage of the fact that you have shared knowledge. And you don't have to be, this is my number one source of information. You don't have to be the source of truth. You have to mitigate or facilitate a conversation amongst the trainees, because honestly, your job with your senior resident is to make sure that they can teach the next generation. This is a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate that. So when I've taught my junior residents who become senior residents, the first thing I have them do is I have them teach the junior residents. And I have them be very specific and say, okay, what did you see? And we may go from bottom to up when we're saying, okay, what did you see? Explain to me what you saw. Why do you think that's happening? And we go through, again, concept-based inquiry. Why? 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 Not what? Not what? Not what? Why? What did you see? But why do you think that's happening? 
Um, you know, for example, I, we talk about, um, I don't know, uh, head and neck uh, when a flap goes down and we use leeches, right? So why do you think we're using leeches? And so then you like try to understand, okay, well, why is the flap failing? Why do why did we decide to use leeches? It, it, there's there's no fact base there. It's really a conceptual understanding of the intricacies of how the flap is working and what happens when the vein goes down. When the vein goes down and starts getting congested, do we care that the vein went down? Well, not really. What do we actually care about? We care about if the vein engorges the flap to the point that the artery goes down. Then it's a really big problem. Right. And so taking that through that flow, but then taking the residents to actually play them off of each other to have that conversation. And you don't have to talk. One thing that I can teach you through this entire thing is you do not have to be the expert. You have to facilitate the conversation. You have to oversee it, but you don't have to be the content deliverer yourself. Like a like a podcast host. Like a Whoa. podcast host, right? It's it's all about ha asking the right questions. And one of the best teachers I ever, ever had um, at, during my master's program now teaches for Harvard Macy. And I learned as much watching her navigate conversations as what she was actually teaching. She's a phenomenal teacher. And when you see her facilitate conversations and direct conversations to where she wanted it to be, but all through facilitating conversation amongst people in the audience, it was mastery. It was mastery. And I try to do that on war routes. I try to absolutely do that on war routes. I try to navigate the conversation, be like, oh, why do you think that happened? And then, you know, you look to the other person and say, okay, can, um, you know, they were asking about this. What do you think the answer to that is? Uh, um, and then the other is not cold calling. So um, if I could say one thing about war rounds and anything where you're in a group, do not cold call people. If you call somebody by their name, all of a sudden they get this huge anxiety and their brain shuts off. If you ask somebody their name in the middle of a large conference room, they may not be able to answer like because they're so anxious. And talking about creating a safe space, cold calling creates an unsafe space. So when you cold call people in a large group, that is not great. What you want to do is you want either warm call, which is, hey, I'm going to ask you in this group to answer this question or you leave it open to the audience to see whoever wants to answer. And there's a period of uncomfortable silence that will eventually pass and somebody will say something because they're so uncomfortable. So utilizing the silence in a couple of different ways. One, utilize the silence and that you're waiting, wait for someone to say something. And second, utilize your own silence while you're waiting for the team to have a discussion and play off of each other. Because, because silence does not necessarily mean they don't know. Silence means that they're processing. And the entire the entire act of getting somebody to, to share their knowledge requires them to incorporate that knowledge into a cogent thought and then create a cogent sentence that concisely conveys their understanding. That takes time. That is not instantaneous. So you can't just cold call somebody and say, okay, Brad, what's this? And you like, you're given half a second. Nobody processes co co complex compacts in a half a second. You have to give them time to process, time to think. And in the meantime, you're silent. You just let everybody start to think because you want everybody to create their own answer in their own head. And then eventually somebody will get confident enough and somebody will get uncomfortable enough in the silence that they'll actually share their knowledge. And then you have something to talk about. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. It was they share their knowledge and now you can use it as a jumping off point. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, you don't necessarily need to teach about the thing that you thought you were going to teach, right? You can use that, whatever that person said, as the starting off point, but it doesn't have to be in the direction that you were planning to go. You can go in a different direction if that's where the conversation takes you. It doesn't have to be, it's not like, you know, I was required to talk about this today, otherwise they're never going to learn it. Like a lot of this is just reinforcement over time, hearing the same things over and over, similar takes on it. So, you know, don't be so tied to talking about what you thought you were going to talk about. 
A hundred percent. You have to be flexible. I never give the same presentation twice. Never, ever, ever. Even as if it's the same exact audience the next year, the same exact knowledge base that I assume, I never give the same talk twice. And the reason why is because you're disregarding adult learners. Adult learners don't come in as a blank slate. The old tabula rasa is not true. People come in with prior knowledge. And so if you assume that every second year has that same amount of knowledge, you're going to be wrong. And so basically, and I do this on in the clinic, in the office hours, where I'm giving a talk about Strider, and I have like five or six things that I like to talk about with Strider, but I don't know which of the things and how that conversation is going to go until I assess the knowledge of the learner and see where they are and where they need to be. The mistake is, is walking in and saying, I'm going to teach you five things, whether you like it or not. I don't know. I don't care if you know this already or not. That is wasteful of your time and their time. You have to be flexible. You have to be adaptive in this personalized learning space. You have to imbibe it. You don't need technology to be a personalized learner. You have to listen. You have to assess and you have to be flexible with your teaching. I'm going to start giving my lectures differently. I'm hearing that, <laughs> really, because, because I, I also think it's important to realize, I'm sorry, something that I just said, which was, which is this is not the only time they're going to have to learn this one thing, Correct. right? And so you have to be, flexible enough to be able to play off of them as the learners rather than coming in with the, you know, these are the 11 things that you're going to learn. You're going to learn from me because you're never going to hear them again, right? Like that they're not going to learn to your point. You're not going to, they're not going to learn that way. They're not going to retain it. Whereas if you come in asking questions and you guide them in whatever direction they end up taking it, they're going to, then now they're going to remember that. Now they're going to remember it as opposed to you just talking at them. And my, my professor, Monica, was masterful at this. And she knew in general directions and the, the things she wanted to walk away with, but she never knew how we were going to get there. And she would facilitate the conversation in such a way that we would eventually get there and everybody would take some nugget of information away from it. And I think the idea, especially when you're talking about didactics and PowerPoints, they are so wasteful if you don't solicit information from your audience. You are totally missing the mark unless you assess where your learners are and where they need to go and how you're going to get them there. If you just say, I'm assuming you're here and you need to go here, you're going to miss a majority of your students because so they're not all that. in the same place. Let's talk yeah. about that. Let's talk about grand rounds. Let's talk about you've got like a auditorium full of learners, right? And you're up there with your PowerPoint going slide after slide after slide, talking about what you came to talk about. Right, you're the foremost researcher, Eric, on pinky toenails. So you came to talk about the pinky toenail, right? And you've got everything that you want to tell everybody about the pinky toenail. And you're going to go through the latest research, the latest and greatest. Where's the field going? The history of it, right? You've got your slides. That doesn't sound like what you're talking about, but that sounds like most lectures that I've given and been to. So. What are we doing? What there's are we doing big, with grand rounds? There's a big difference between teaching and understanding. So when professors come in and say, I'm going to teach you everything I know about subject X, they not taking into account where the student's understanding is and where it needs to be. <clears throat> and if you walk in thinking, I'm going to cover these five things, whether you like it or not, you may be teaching five things that they already know, or they may not be advanced enough to know. And so unless you actually facilitate the learning and concept-based and understand where people's prior knowledge is, you're going to miss the base with the majority of people. So, and, and I hear all the time from people who are giving didactics, the, the students didn't show up, the residents didn't show up. And I said, okay, why do you think that is? They're just disengaged. They're not interested. I said, well, what were you talking about? And I said, did you, you know, is this the same lecture you've given a hundred times that they have a video of at home that they can watch it 2X? You know, so a lot of professors, it's like that. They give the same lecture every single year for an hour, and they have a recorded version of it at home, and they can watch it at 2x. Think about who listens to podcasts at 1x anymore. Who listens, who watches shows at 1x anymore? Why would they waste an hour of their time when they can get the same information in 30 minutes? You know, so like you have to understand where people are coming to listen to. They're not there for you to regurgitate facts. They're there for you to connect the concepts and answer hard questions for them and to make sure that they have an understanding of what it is you want to teach about. You're not there to teach. You're there to make sure they understand. 
And you cannot check for understanding unless you actually solicit information from your audience. But how are you doing that in a large group? Easy, easy. Uh, number one, I use an audience response system and I don't use multiple choice because multiple choice takes away the process that students take to understand and create a conceptual model in their mind about what they're talking about. So for example, um, I give a lot of talks on tracheostomies. So I get uh, a bunch of audience response systems. How often do you work with trachs? Have you ever seen the surgery? Um, you know, what do you know about trachs? I have an open-ended question at the beginning. It's all anonymous again. So it's totally anonymous. Nobody's name is associated with it. In a big group, you know, we're talking 100, 200 people. Tell me everything you know about trachs. And so you start to see some of the answers start to roll in and you can assess where's people knowledge base is based on the questions that come in. If they're very basic, then you know you have to start at a basic level with the lecture or with the, with the discussion. If it's very high level and people actually understand what you're already going to talk about, guess what? You better be flexible and change your plan. Because if they already know everything you're about to teach, you're about to waste your time in theirs unless you change your, unless you change your lecture. And so in real time, I will actually change my lecture. And the way that I facilitate that is I use mostly pictures in my PowerPoints. And it's mostly conceptual-based pictures. So if I'm talking about trachs, I talk about physics. I know they know physics, but they don't understand why physics matters in tracheostomies. So I'll talk about Bernoulli's. I'll talk about Pesai's. I'll talk about, um, you know, I'll talk about, um, uh, what's the other concept? Reynolds number. Talk about, you know, all these concepts so that they have a base understanding of the phenomenon that they see and hey, are given the language to understand it. Now, many people don't connect those things. And so I know that that's something that's relatively new for people. But then we apply it and say, okay, now that you understand Reynolds number, why do you think this is happening? And I will wait. I will sit there and wait for the audience to respond, whether it's open on uh, chat, whether it's an audience response system, whether it's verbal, whether they verbalize it. I will sit there and wait for people to say, because I need to make sure that what I just explained to them, they can actually apply to a meaningful situation. So I say, okay, we hear inspiratory strider during uh, learning Malaysia. Why is it inspiratory? Why don't you hear it expiratory? And you sit there and wait, because now you're basically taught them physics of the Bernoulli effect, but now you're asking them to apply the Bernoulli effect into a specific context so that they don't memorize that laryngeal malacia is inspiratory. You don't want them to memorize. You want them to conceptually understand the concept that as it narrows, the velocity goes up. As the velocity goes up, the vacuum from Bernoulli's effect increases and the tissue falls in, perpetuating that cycle to make it. And then when they exhale, all that tissue goes away and there's no strider on exhalation. That is what you're trying to teach, not the fact that Loring of Malaysia has inspiratory strider. Well, thank you for going into the uh, Bernoulli effect. Uh, <laughs> it's my, it's my, one of my favorite physics principles because it actually applies to a number of things in, uh, in, yes. in otolaryngology. Um, Absolutely. A little off topic, but when you're explaining it, what is the, do you, do you make like a real world analogy? Like, do you're like, yeah. and, and okay, so what do you, do you use like, um, was it prairie dog holes is one of the ones that like the pressure, uh, the, the, the wind and, and the pressure, so it actually ventilates the prairie dog holes? Or is it, this is why you get attacked by your shower curtain when you turn the water on? What, no, uh, what's you have a great example now. Now that everybody's eco, you have paper straws. You have something at your, so I love the idea that the HMX fundamentals uh, were doing. What they did was they take abstract concepts, drill them down to the basic concepts and apply it to something that's every day something they can grasp, something they understand conceptually. You then take that concept and apply it to the medical context using the same logic and have them apply the logic and check for understanding. That is the cycle that I go through with every single thing, every single thing. For example, if I'm talking about one-way valves and tracheostomies and why they can help with airway clearance, I say, okay, how do you cough? T take me through, go ahead, go ahead and cough. And so they'll, they'll like, Okay, uh, uh, take it apart for me. What happened first? And everybody's like, I guess I, I took a breath in. I was like, okay, what happened next? Uh, I guess I, I closed my glottis. Okay, now what? I'm starting to exhale, and then I rapidly opened my glottis. Okay, you're creating subglottic pressure. So how does a one-way valve help you create subglottic pressure? And so then they have to understand, where's the one-way valve? Where's air going? Where's the path of least resistance? Why, if they have too big of a trach, does the, the one-way valve pop off? 
right? Like these are the concepts that I'm trying to teach. I'm not having them memorize. I'm having them conceptually understand. And that is the critical component that faculty have to do to impart onto students is have them conceptually understand what's going on and they can solve all the problems you've never even realized they might have to solve. Amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. So we, we, I'd like to be able to get to a little bit more. Uh, sure. We're, we're covering a lot of ground. Um, so same, you know, we're looking for some pearls here, but now we were talking about it before the show in the operating room where you're yeah. not just trying to, uh, teach about right concepts and you're also trying to teach skills, right? So how do you, while you're also trying to operate on the patient, so how do yes. you manage all that? So, uh, you know, it might just be you and, and another and, and one trainee, right? Like if you and I are doing a tonsillectomy or, you know, if you're doing, if you're doing a thyroid, if you're doing a laryngotracheal reconstruction, there's going to be a couple of other people in the room. There might be a fellow, might be a resident, might be a student. Um, so now you've got a couple in the room. So it might sometimes a little more intimate and sometimes uh, there's a couple. What's different about the operating room or, right, because you're on back table, the IR suite, right? Not the just IR the suite, absolutely. Room. So the number one I, advice I have for faculty, never assume somebody's skill level based on their year in training. Never, ever, ever assume skill level, just like you never assume knowledge base. I have plenty of residents that were second year residents that could do a laryngeal cleft better than fellows. Until you challenge them and see where their skill level is at, you don't know their capabilities. And if you under challenge them, there's a concept called the zone of proximal development. And the zone of proximal development states that with scaffolding, students can achieve a certain level. And they, uh, beyond that level, they're too challenging, even with help, they couldn't achieve it. If you over challenge people, they will burn out, they'll get anxious, and they will lose confidence in their abilities, and their performance will suffer as a consequence. If you under challenge people, you are wasting your time and theirs because you want to be maximally efficient in the OR. It's all about efficiency. And the same thing goes with teaching your residents. If you maximally efficient, then you take them to the area in that zone of proximal development and take them just to the edge of their abilities. And you challenge them, you keep them on that upper border of what they can do with help and what they can't. And you keep them there. So I will uh, take residents when I have brand new residents, I say, you know, get a general sense before we go in where they're at with their skills and where they want to be. If they've never done the procedure, then we start out at the basics. But a lot of them come in with some previous knowledge. So for tonsillectomies, for example, I'll take them in and I'll say, hey, you know, when you've done these in the past, um, where have you had struggles before? And they say, well, I've had a lot of struggles right at finding the plane. I said, okay, we're going to focus on finding the plane for you. And what I'll do is I'll put the mouth gag in, I'll put them in suspension, I'll put the red rubber in, I'll do everything that is rote and it's, it's really not helpful for them at that moment in time. What they need is help finding the plane. Then when we do is, is I show them, okay, this is how I find the plane on the right, you find the plane on the left. And if they do it awesome, they're like, hey, you're, you're much better than you think you are. What, let's, what's the next thing you need to focus on? Or if they just like, are very basic and they're not even at that level yet, that's where I change the whole entire plan. It's all about being flexible, we talked about. Now I say, okay, you, you, you know, I know you feel like you need to do this, but we need to take a step back. I think you need to sort of understand tissue planes. You need to understand tension. You need to understand um, what you're looking at. Let's take a step back. Or if they're like, hey, you already have it. All right, let's work on efficiency. You know, you already know the steps of the procedure. Let's make you more efficient. Always ask for things before you need them. Make sure you have all your equipment before the case starts. Make sure everybody knows what your plan is and how much time you have left, right? So we work on efficiency and then we work on making it look beautiful. This is an analogy from boxing called line speed beauty that I follow in the OR. And so once they have a line, they have the efficiency, then we work on, let's make it look easy. Let's make it look beautiful. And by the time I make it look beautiful, they're usually done with me. So they usually go on to the next one. But it's the same with every procedure. And never assume that their abilities in one domain, like endoscopic surgery, is the same in other domains like otology, right? Everybody's skills in those different areas progress at different levels. And unless you have that pre-brief with them and the post-brief say, hey, what went well? What are things you want to work on? And how can I help you get there? I want you to give me feedback on my teaching. 
what went, what worked for you, what didn't work for you, what can I do as a teacher to get you to that next level? Yeah, I think that's one of the more one of the more challenging things about our profession in particular, right? Like the skills that you have for big open neck surgery, different for your endoscopic laryngeal skills, different yep. for your sinus skills, different for like drilling a mastoid. Like these things are so complete. Like I get it, the ear, nose, and throat they're connected, but all of these skill sets and these they're so radically different. Yep. It's uh, it's one of the more challenging things of our profession. But that's, yeah. but that's what we love about our profession, right? Yeah. You know, in a day exactly. you'll do like five different, completely different types of surgery. <clears throat> but again, don't assume that somebody who's a second year doesn't know how to drill a mastoid. You don't know what experience they have. You don't understand where their principles are at. Uh, maybe they spent hours in the temporal bone lab and they just are, they're awesome. But until you actually challenge them and see where their skill levels are at, you won't understand. And, and again, like I said, the, the struggle is what matters. If you're resident is not struggling, they're not learning. You need to constantly struggle. And the example I give is when we're doing ear tubes, once they're doing ear tubes and they're really good at them, I don't just let them do the ear tubes by themselves. What I do is, okay, well, now I want you to do two-handed technique. I want you to start using the suction in your left hand and your uh, rosin in the right hand to get that ear tube in. Again, constantly challenging them, never, never letting off the gas because I want to get them ready for middle ear surgery. So if I'm going to get the middle, there are skills that I can impart just doing ear tubes that will get them better at doing middle ear surgery. I will do it. I will continually challenge them. And I tell them that I'm continually challenge them. The last pearl, and we can move on from this, is never take away the surgery and don't give it back. There is nothing more demoralizing than having a resident get stuck. You take it away from them and you never let them do that again. The key is, is to get them over that hump and tell them, watch what I do the second I take over. And I'm just going to get you past this little part and I'm going to hand it back to you. And when you hand it back, that, that feeling is, okay, now I got this. And the next time they know how to problem solve that problem and let them struggle safely through that part to see if they picked up how to problem solve for themselves. If they don't problem solve for themselves, they're not going to grow. So last venue. And that's office hours. So the big challenge of office hours is you've got a full schedule, right? Like to be able to take someone through the Bernoulli principle and Strider, right? When you have 30 patients to see and chart in a day, right? While trying to teach them, it has the advantage of a lot of time when you do office hours, it's just you and one other person, right? So you have one, one trainee at a time to teach, but you're spending most of the time with the patient. So what what's your pearl or pearls for teaching in office hours? I have a few. So uh, one is, is the whole concept of micro learning. So learning doesn't have to be an hour didactic. Micro learning can happen in seconds, minutes. Um, I do take advantage of, um, I educate a lot for families and I think we all do. And when I educate the families, I'm also educating the resident at the same time. So I'm actually yeah. doubling down yes. and I try to explain it to them in a way. And I may even look and quip at the resident, uh, a slightly higher level note, like, Hey, you know, learning Malaysia, your kid's mostly going to grow out of it. It gets worse before it gets better. And the reason why is because your children, your child is growing and their oxygen needs are outgrowing the size of their larynx. And eventually their larynx will catch up, their voice box will catch up and the strider will get better, but it gets worse before it gets better. That is for the family, but also for the residents so that they understand the concept of why strider gets worse initially in lingual malaysia and then gets better. So it's that doubling down effect. And I can't, I can't impart enough that idea of having them write down everything they know about a subject because you never understand misconceptions and people's knowledge base until you give them a blank sheet of paper and tell me everything you know about Strider. And then what you do is you pick apart those little spots where you're like, okay, you said it was inspiratory Strider. Why do you think that? And when you get a patient with inspiratory Strider, what do you hear? What do you think is going on? And you take advantage and jump off of the point that you just did while you were charting in the office in with the patient and you choose that as a jumping off point. The other thing that I've seen people do is have people read articles and come in with some kind of subject that they want to take away from, or you assign it to them after office hours. Like, hey, we saw this one patient with this crazy thing. Why don't you look it up and come back to me next office hours and we'll talk about it. 
So there, there are things like that. But I, I think the the digest of of just give us everything you know, and then I sort of correct the misconceptions, put the pieces together, build the shelves, um, and have them walk away with a general knowledge of very small sets of things. And they obviously have the other informal learning that they take away from just us talking to the families. Amazing. Amazing. We're all going to come better, come away better teachers. And how many, <laughs> how many, you know, students that everyone who listens to this podcast is now going to be able to have a more positive influence on, you know, it's like uh, infectious. So I hope so. Really I hope so. Am- amazing material, amazing material. So you have a couple of things that I want you to plug right now. Level X, back table, and you know, where else can, can people find you? Yeah, so people can find me on uh, Twitter at Dr. Uh, at D-R-E-R-I-C-G-A-N-T, as well as on LinkedIn. Um, I am the Vice President Medical Director of Level X. I oversee everything from an education medical standpoint. We make medical video games for healthcare professionals, so you can reimagine how you experience medical content in a video game environment while earning CME, completely free to download on Android and on Apple. Uh, and then I also am a, a co-host of the Innovation Podcast for Backtable, uh, where we innovate interview physician entrepreneurs and talk about their innovations in this digital health space and in the innovation entrepreneurship space. Very, very exciting. Um, Started by an interventional radiologist um, and a really, really great group. And we have unbelievable guests on, so I strongly recommend it. Um, I also advise for a company called Neural Lab that's making touchless user interfaces using AI. Uh, So lots of cool stuff coming down the pipeline for us in, in the healthcare industry. We're living in a phenomenal time where technology is really going to change the way that we practice medicine. And I think we're very fortunate to be in this time. Dr. Eric Gantworker, thanks so much for your time. Always a pleasure. Always, always a pleasure. Thanks, Brad. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.